Hello, everybody. Uh, now on the hour, uh, welcome. Uh, this is the first webinar of 2022 for the Crisis Communications Network. Lovely to be back um, with you all. Um, we have a very challenging um, subject uh, today. Uh, we will be uh, looking at the issue of crisis communications um, and terrorism, which is probably uh, one of the ultimate challenges uh, and one we all hope that we will never have to face. Um, but I'm delighted that we've got such an excellent um, panel here to, uh, to uh, share their insights, and I'll introduce them uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, just a few, a few housekeeping. Um, today's session will run probably anything up to a, a, an hour, um, depending on the questions from the floor and from yourself, really. Um, but, you know, that's what we have scheduled. Uh, there are five CPD points. Um, for achieving, uh, for uh, attending rather, the, uh, the webinar today. So we can, uh, we can bank those. Uh, do put any questions uh, you have uh, in, the, uh, in the chat box uh, or in the, uh, the Q&A as we go along. Um, my co-chair Catherine will be uh, picking those up. Um, uh, so you can use either of those two ways uh, to, uh, to do that. I just see my first guest, who I was just about to introduce, has just uh, left Zoom, or rather Zoom has left her. So I hope that she's, uh, I hope that she's back uh, super, super quickly. Uh, so I'm gonna, first I'm gonna introduce it by Toby, who is here. Uh, hi, Toby, Toby Williamson. Uh, our, he's gonna be our second guest. And, and Toby very humbly always reminds us when we talk to him that he's not a PR uh, professional. Uh, but what he is, uh, is a very highly qualified communicator, and you're going to, to see that um, uh, in, a, in a moment. He actually led the emergency response for Fishmongers Hall back in 2019, when what should have been a conference on prisoner rehabilitation turned into a, a, a terrorist incident. Uh, Toby's background is in the, in the Navy. Uh, it's, it's Commodore Toby Williams, am I right, Toby? Uh, and uh, in the Navy, as an officer, he did have communications training. And that's something I would really like to explore with him when I get to, to talk to him. And you may have questions about that as, as well and how that actually works and, and how it served him during that extremely difficult um, incident. Um, we're going to kick off with, with Amanda. So welcome back, Amanda. Uh, I don't know what happened there with Zoom, but uh, it, Zoom it kicked me out. Zoom kicked you out. I thought that's what had happened. Uh, Amanda Coleman, I actually got her book here. There you go. Uh, author of a fantastic book on crisis communication strategies. She is uh, a communications consultant, a crisis communications consultant. Uh, she's also a fellow of both the CIPR and the PRCA and was previously head of uh, corporate communications for Greater Manchester Police. And it was in that role that she dealt with a number of uh, crises and terrorist incidents, including the Manchester Arena terrorist incident, which I'm sure many of you will, uh, will remember. So of course, Amanda can share her experiences as obviously as a PR professional and a crisis communications consultant, but will also be able to tell us about the police. Um, I'm hoping a little bit about how the police operate in incidents of, um, of this kind, because of course, if we ever are involved in an incident of this kind, uh, we will largely be taking our lead from the emergency services. And obviously, something Toby has a lot of experience about as well. So um, let's just kick off. Hello, Amanda. So let's let's hear from you uh, with your insights and perspectives on this, uh, on this issue. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for that. I'll just see if the technology does work, hopefully. Because um, I've, I've tried not to go deaf by power. It's a few slides. Um, <clears throat> key bits for me, um, having been through through what we went through, what is coming up for five years ago, and it feels like yesterday. And I was just talking to some students this morning, uh, PR students um, around crisis comms. And when I was reliving the kind of chain of events, um, it was as almost as if I was there. So you know, we need to be prepared that these things will never leave us. I don't think they'll ever leave us. Um, and for me. The, the key learning in all this, and I'll talk a little bit about the police. Um, I could talk endlessly about it, but a little bit <laughs> before I finish, um, is that all plans and processes and everything we had were all great. Um, but the one thing that none of it did back in 2017 was focus on the people. So my my whole kind of focus now, what I try and kind of talk to people about and what we did in the aftermath of, of the arena was to revise, revise, revamp, look at the plans and make sure they were rooted in people. 
so that it was it was you know not just um the the people who were affected victims families but also um the frontline staff and the people who were going to be there so that everything communication wise needed to be to help them um and support them through the really difficult time um everything else became secondary so you know police investigations are important but it became secondary to what was the important thing to do um and the reason being if you focus on people then your decision is going to be better. If your decision making is focused on other things, then you're missing out big chunks of what are what is kind of really important. Lots of planning and preparation um, goes on within policing and within emergency services. This was just this was a year before the arena, um, which was a, a, a full blown exercise involving a whole range of uh, of people uh, that happened at the Trafford Centre, and. Um, key from that was actually to do something with that planning and that preparation and from a communi communication perspective we had done we'd had lots of conversations with uh, pub other public sector communicators so we were when it happened in a better position than perhaps we would have been because we talked about it's not just a case of uh, if it happens but when it happens and I think that's the thing to take away it doesn't matter where you work the, the chance of you getting involved in something like this is always there um, so you do need to have had those conversations and you do need to think about who who would you speak to, what would you do, uh, how would you approach it um, and what structures and systems would you have in place uh, to be able to support that and to get that information. I'm going to whistle through my stuff because Toby's stuff's going to be way more interesting. Um, things to think about focus for me has to be on uh, risk management in the first place. So, you know, if we recognise um, that we are all uh, vulnerable to potentially being involved in something like this, if you look at your organisation, your business, where it's risks, you know, if you've got if you've got big shopping centres, if you've got um, particularly vulnerable sites, we could all do this work. I mean, obviously, it happens within the emergency planning world, and I am now involved in the emergency planning society which is something i never would have thought i would ever get involved in but i mean there's people that work on this and there's communicators we need to understand what they're doing because you'll find that, that you'll be able to spot um what you can do how could you look at the communication around some of these aspects um if you know where your risk management uh, risk process is and, and risk is uh also do you know what you need to do so what's your approach going to be how would you deal with it what would you say Who's going to be the person that would speak for the business if you, you know if you're caught up in that? So think about all those aspects, and you you know there's no reason any of any of us any business couldn't have a one page plan for if they got caught up in a terrorist incident. It doesn't have to be you know there's lots of different types of terrorist incident you can be involved in. It doesn't really matter, but you can boil it right down to what what is the approach that we were going to take and make sure those structures are in place, uh, because nobody wants to be working out who's how does the governance work, how do I get my statement signed off, who's the one that's going to give me the best, most up to date information when you're in the middle of it. You need all this beforehand, and that's one thing that that the police, um, the police and the military, I'm sure Toby would say, have is a very very strong structure around dealing with crisis and dealing with incidents that happen. So look at where do you turn, who are you going to speak to, who are your key stakeholders. Again, all the things that you do on a day to day basis are really important during a crisis. So you look at, you know, in particular a terrorist incident, you look at your stakeholders. You know, if you've got your stakeholder mapping in place, if you know everybody is, you know where to turn. So not just in terms of the information that you need, but also in in what uh, in what you need to to share with your kind of key networks. Um, and when I say where to turn. Again, we should all know who the the kind of local police uh, comms people are. Um, they won't like me for saying this, <laughs> but, but they really should. You know, because if you know who they are, then you you've got more of an in to be able to um, get that information, to know what processes they're going to use, and to know they're going to deal with things. As I've said, and I'll probably say many many more times um, before I fin before I finish work today, and lots of things is the people is what matters. Um, if you look, there's lots of conversations around, obviously, the, the terrible events in Ukraine um, and, and looking at the President Zelensky and about how fantastic his communication is. I can't look at it like that yet because it's about lives. It's not about communication tips and, and hints. But what he's doing is what matters. He's doing what matters for the people. That's the, that's where his focus is. The fact that his communication is great is 
for me kind of only comes from the fact that he's he's focused in the right way. So um I I've just blogged literally before we came on here because if you contrast that to the photograph of Liz Truss and apologies if anybody had anything to do with that, but her being pictured um, stood in front of two flags means nothing, you know? So it, it's, it's about the, the where she focus and, and what that should be um, about. Banish the thoughts of reputation. As I just said, that is irrelevant. What matters is that you get through the situation that you're in um, and not that you come out of it looking better than you went in or that you've protected the reputation of the business. That way for me lies a whole heap of problems, which I won't even go into because I could be here for hours. Um, other things to think about is your resi resilience, your own resilience, that of your team, that of the organisation. Um, and I'm sure Toby's got a lot more to share about how it, it drains you emotionally, physically, psychologically. It, um, it's, a, it's a tough situation to face and be in. And that's why well-being is so important. You know, how do we deal with what's happened? How do we support the people who are caught up in it, who are around it, who've responded to it? And that includes communications. And we've stressed this a few, quite a few times, um, that you can, the things you know and the things I've kind of learnt and, and knew about what happened um, and how people were affected in Manchester will never leave me. They will always be in my head. So actually it's as important that you get support as anybody else that is, is right in the middle of it. Um, but it's your story is going to be your story. And these are things that affect so many people. So don't try and kind of control. This is again, trying, well, I, I kind of go back to try and speak to the police about, but you know, they have a, a part of the story, but so do lots of other people. Um, and bear that in mind, because the more you try and control things, um, the, the, the more it becomes kind of unmanageable really. Um, and so recognize that it's a part of a, a jigsaw and it's a part of a bigger picture. And you can very easily go from hero to villain. Um, this was something, uh, the front page of the Manchester Human News came out a couple of, it was the day after Friday, at the end of that week. Um, but actually, if you see some of the headlines now that have come out of the public inquiry, um, they've gone from heroes to villains. So again, it's about not putting yourself in that pedestal of how weren't we great, pat, let's pat ourselves on the back. Um, and, and we, uh, you know, when I was working in at Manchester, we were very, very uh, cognizant of that um, for this very reason is that, you you know, it doesn't feel right, does it, to be giving people awards when they've dealt with something like this. It feels it doesn't just doesn't sit right uh, when people have been through such horrific things. Um, so, again, you know, you do your best job, but don't look for the plaudits. Don't look for the acclaim. Things, there are lots of resources coming out. Um, if you are interested in terms of human impact of disasters, Kel Bratas's book is really good. He was, um, he works for the Norwegian government, um, was um, involved in the kind of post-2011 uh, uh, terrorist incidents and has done a lot of work speaking to um, people who have been involved in disasters and looking at how they were supported. And there's loads of really good case studies in his book that came out uh, last year, I think. But also Survivor, Survivors Against Terror, because they've put out recently some advice to journalists from their experiences. And again, you know, from a PR it's, it's really important to look at what they are saying, how they feel, because when you're doing your statement, when you're pulling things together, you know, re read that, understand that, have that in your head, um, that's the way we try to work. Um, you know, what are they going to think if they see this written? What's that going to sound like if we say if, if we say this or we do that? So there's lots of resource out there definitely to use. And it's a long term thing. Five years on, we're still talking about the arena because the inquiry is going on. Um, there are still people who are who are uh, affected by it um, in terms of responders. Obviously, the, the families of victims, are, are, you know, always going to be. Uh, dealing with with what happened um but it is a long-term thing and again you know preparing dealing with recovery is as critical if not more critical in my perspective than some of the initial response we focus all our attention on how do we respond to the initial stuff we're actually you know for a lot of organizations a lot of businesses a lot of public sector the recovery the how do you move from dealing a crisis to to the bit that comes after it and adapting and developing and changing is more problematic so, um, there is obviously the CIPR um, guide as well, which I think came out a couple of years ago. I could be wrong. Um, so again, have a look at that. But the key for me in terms of the police is the police will want you to say nothing 
about anything to do with a terrorist incident because they'll want to try and control everything to make sure nothing impacts on a potential a court case and a potential conviction. Um, I think from my perspective, that's it's a it's a bit of an easy it's a sledgehammer to crack a nut really you know if you tell people to do that you miss massive opportunities where people can actually support the police investigation um i think the thing for me is just to if you if you are dealing with anything bear that in mind that there are legal implications um so just try and, and cast your eye over anything you do in that sort of in instance to make sure that you don't think it's going to go kind of wide of the mark if you're right in the middle of it then the police will be saying well, listen let's see it before you you do it but if you're kind of involved on the periphery just look at it as a live investigation that might end up in a, a trial and a court case so again you know legally you wouldn't want to be doing anything that could prejudice or cause a, cause a problem with that and i think i've whistled through that, that i shall stop sharing Thank you. That was that was amazing, Amanda. And it was just so so much useful stuff in in in, in there. Can, can I just pick up? You you talked about, and I love the way you said a one page preparation rather than you know a, a, a telephone directory that sometimes you, I see when I go and look at organisations. What would be what would be on that one page um, uh, to prepare you in the best possible way? I mean, I think if you're talking with the about you know your your essentially on the periphery of a terrorist incident then i would just look at what is what is it that you want to need to do in the in the sh short term um or short to medium term um and what will what's the business want to focus on um i wouldn't get into a whole heap of other things because it's almost an irrelevance it's really looking at where's your information what are you going to say um and, and our plan that, that we had pre-arena literally had, if there's something happens, our first message will be, we know something's happened, we're dealing with it, um, stay away from the area and we'll provide you with more information. So we can get that agreed before anything happens. Mm -hmm. So we never get mm -hmm. authorization when it happens. So you can go, move within 10, 15, 20 minutes, not, mm -hmm. you know, an hour later when somebody's finally authorized your 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 statement so that's what for me it would be to really really tactically practical here's some stuff that we know we can do because you'll get time to well you'll get a little bit of time to develop those kind of more detailed plans yeah. but it's it's just having something ready for that minute that instant yeah sort of jumping into the vacuum as it were even yeah. if that really is all you can say to acknowledge that yeah. something's happened Catherine, do we have any Amanda, q a's or questions? i do i do amanda a question from helen breeze hello helen do you have any advice for dealing with the media on site during or after an incident? We're a city centre university campus and I'm conscious most of the site is public areas where press could access. Is it up to the police to create and manage a cordon? Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the police will have a cordon. Um, I think the thing will be on an operation, I'm getting really operationally boring now, but on an operational kind of bit, they you you could negotiate around where is best. They will tell you where they think the cordon should be. But if you're saying actually, we would like it to be a bit wider because this is a vulnerable spot then somebody operationally from the from the kind of uh, university should be able to help with that um i think the key bit is to give them somewhere to go um you know they, they won't all they will still get the wanderers and the media that kind of you know drift off to different places but if you need them to be somewhere then get them to go there we didn't do anything in the city center um on on the kind of in the immediate aftermath of the arena because we we're telling people to stay away from start with but we we wanted them to be at police headquarters which is 10 minutes away so it's not like they've got to go miles um it was easier for us to manage it that way so i think that's the thing try and offer them an alternative and also negotiate to perhaps get your cordon um a bit wider if that helps you kind of practically okay thank you one more question if we may before we move on um, is it worth planning in advance the sort of public media statements you might put out in the event of an incident and then updating and finalising them once you know exactly what's happened? I'll ask Amanda and Chris that question. Uh, for me, yes and no. Um, I think yes to have something basic, like I said, for some of those initial things that give you somewhere to go from. But I would avoid being too rigid um, because you'll find that whatever you've planned for will, won't be what, what happens anyway. Um, so all our planning had been on a marauding firearms type attack. What we had was a suicide bomber. There's a, a vast difference, really. So, you know, none of our 
de- more detailed kind of uh, messaging would have ever worked. You know, we never used the run, tell, hide because we didn't need to because there was nothing else kind of happening. And that would be that was always there. You must use that. So I would say yes, in a very broad initial sense. Um, but I would avoid getting too specific because you'll find it, you know, you might put something out that's that's not actually what's happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely, as Amanda said, and uh, this is sometimes what I do see with with clients. They 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 brainstormed all the possible risks, which obviously you should do, but then they have a communications plan for every single possible risk, and it is never going to actually turn out exactly how you you thought. It's much more useful to have uh, you know, the holding statement, as Amanda has said. That's that's absolutely crucial. But then you know the basic facts and figures that will enable you to build the statement that actually reflects. Um, that the true incident so you can be you can be too pr- over prepared from that point of view um, and you will find senior management say but we signed off a statement about this and you're saying yes but that's what's happened and you don't have time to do that do you Amanda it's better not to get into that <laughs> yeah yeah those initial things though definitely because that gives you the speed and I say you know it's not a golden hour anymore it's about 25 minutes 30 minutes maximum yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Getting shorter all the time. Excellent. Mm. Thank you for that, Amanda. Anything else, Catherine, the Q&A? No, that's box? it for the time okay. being. Thank you. That's okay, nice. fantastic. Thank you. Let's let's move on to to, uh, to Toby. And as I say, he's always keen to point out that he's not a, a PR professional, let alone a member of the, uh, the, the CIPR, but he was trained in communications as part of his Navy experience. Um, and uh, he put that to excellent use. And we'll, we'll see uh, an example of one of the interviews he did uh, after his um, his presentation, now just to remind us, uh, Toby um, uh, is uh, it, it looks after uh, the Fishmongers Hall. He is the clerk of the Fishmongers Hall um, in uh, in London near London Bridge, um, and uh, we go back here to 2019 uh, when what should have been a conference on prisoner rehabilitation, probably the sort of event that. The halls such as Fishmongers are host all the time, bringing together people to talk and debate and exchange their views, unfortunately turned into a terrorist incident um, with three people, including the terrorists, actually uh, left dead um, at the end of that of that incident. So I've just got here a short, and I'm really going to test uh, the technology here, I've got a short video I'm going to show you, just reminding you of events on the, on the day, and then we're going to ask Toby for his his insight. So let's see if I am able to do that. Let me just get on to there. One moment. And here we are. <clears throat> Hang on one moment. Let's just stop that share because I remember now when you share a video, you need to do something a little bit different. Um, There we go. Share sound. Otherwise, you won't get sound. Hold on one moment. Good evening, I'm Riz Latif. Welcome to BBC London and to viewers across the country joining us on the BBC News Channel. We are here by London Bridge, which is in lockdown, uh, as is the surrounding area. As we've been hearing, as police and this city once again deals with a terrorist incident. As we have been hearing in the last few minutes, two members of the public have been killed in this attack. Uh, Several others are injured and the attacker has been shot dead. Now, for those people who are just joining us now or coming home from work, let me just recap uh, what we know so far. It was on this bridge earlier this afternoon at around two o'clock that armed police shot dead a man believed uh, to be wearing a hoax explosive device. Now, there were some terrifying scenes for people who were around. It's a busy time of day and those that were in offices surrounding it. Uh, But as the mayor put it, we also saw some breathtaking heroism because members of the public ran towards the man who had a knife and they restrained him before police stepped in. Now, hopefully we will get uh, an update on some of those who are injured later on. We will also hear uh, from some eyewitnesses as well, because not only is this attack echo the one two and a half years ago on London Bridge, 
but it also saw some remarkable acts of heroism again. Um, so we will hear about that later on. But first tonight, Tom Edwards reports on how events unfolded here this afternoon and also some of those who saw and filmed what happened. So I'm going to stop there because I think that just gives us a, a flavour really of, of, of those awful um, events. So I'm going to hand over now to, to Toby to take us through um, his insights and perspectives uh, of the day itself. Um, and I think you're going to find it absolutely fascinating. So over, over to you, Toby. Um, Chris and Catherine, thanks so much, and thanks for inviting me um, today. Um, I think the good news is I'm I'm like everyone else, namely uh, I don't have a particular um, um, sort of starting point with all of this. I, I, I'm just a person who happened to be in charge of a particular organisation uh, at the uh, at, at the beginning of an incident, and had to think hard and had to think on my feet. I'm just going to go up through these slides so I get to the beginning. Um, hadn't quite appeared in the right order. Right, so there we go. Um, when it actually broke, uh, I had my eldest son at the dentist, in the dentist's chair, and something popped up on social media, which made me think, mm, this doesn't sound right, doesn't feel right, uh, and had to persuade the dentists that they were going to look after my son uh, for the rest of the afternoon until my wife could come and pick him up. Um, they said they don't do that. I said, you will on this occasion, and uh, got myself back to the hall. Um, as I go through these next few slides, it, it's an interesting point. Of course, I can't see the audience out, out there in front of me. I can see three other people, uh, and I've got a little, uh, little dot at the top of my uh, computer screen. Um, that's an important point to remember, because when you start talking to a camera or, or you start talking to a radio microphone, um, there are a lot of people listening and the way you present yourself and the how, how, how you say it becomes all important as this magnifies uh, up. Some self-set questions which may be of interest to, uh, to those of you who are professionals within the IPR. Um, the judgment of whether you are part of a wider story is not always as straightforward as it seems. In my many years of flying helicopters, when the Christmas tree lights up on the hazard warning panel in front of you in the cockpit, it's not always obvious exactly what the problem is or what you can do about it. You might say, well, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, just look at the pictures that were emerging within tens of minutes onto uh, national media and indeed international media. The two points I just bring out here, one is the first headlines were using London Bridge, not Fishmongers Hall. If I put it to you as to who knows where Fishmongers Hall is, I would think before the 29th of November 2019, very few people would be able to identify that answer. It was London Bridge that was immediately associated. Um, the second is at this instance, it has not been designated as terrorism. That was merely speculation by the media. This could have been a, a shooting incident of any other nature. And, and therefore it's not as obvious as it might seem. However, by the following, uh, well, by the evening of that day, you're beginning to identify the print media. Now this on screen, it is just going to be a whole set of words, and that's the whole point. But what I'm really describing is the number of outlets in which this is getting to. And you will see in the initial ones at the top in very small print, London Bridge, London Bridge, London Bridge, London Bridge. So is this something that we actually need to start having a view on, or is it best to uh, remain a little bit quieter? So all of that, we get to... Saturday morning, um, time to think. This, this picture is merely showing the fact that I took the dog for a walk. And, and, and in that, it is absolutely crucial if you are the person who is clearly in and around the problem, think really carefully as to what your next moves are. And for me, it was clear that we are headline material. The footage is viral and, and, and the newspapers evidentially show 
were paying over a thousand pounds for people with iFoot footage within 20 minutes for anyone who wanted to run, run that in. That's how quickly the offer goes out there. Terrorism was involved, uh, and that's a formal thing that the Home Office designated and has many ramifications up to and including insurance many years down the line. People were dead. Uh, Cobra, which is something we all know about now, is, uh, ha had sat. Uh, so this was at national government level. Gold Command was up and running. Uh, and we're in central London, which makes it very easier as, as a media story that they're all on, on their own back doorstep. So this story will run. Uh, and it's because the name of your building is in the headline, Fishmongers Hall, like Manchester Arena, it becomes synonymous with the event. And finally, without anyone asking our permission, it became the, the name of the inquest. And therefore, it, it, it's with you forever, whether you like it or not. So my first key point is here is recognize the situation you're in and don't misjudge that. The second self-set question is this. Um, is this storm gathering momentum or is it going to, to, to fall away? Um, uh, the day after is normally the shock. What, what happened? Uh, start filling in the, you know, the, the details. The, the media doesn't know what to think at this stage. We saw in the pre previous presentation is they will simply push out their headlines with their best possible interpretation. And, uh, and, and you'll be part of that to a greater or lesser extent. Make a decision. A vacuum is dangerous here. Um, are you going to ask permission to say something or are you just going to do it? Uh, because we're not part of the emergency services, uh, because we're an independent organization, my instinct, and it was no more than that, is don't ask permission, do it. Now there's risk involved in that, but the second point, and my only other big point, this whole thing is recognize the situation you're in and then compose and deliver the narrative. That, that is yours. Everything else is secondary because this is going to be played out in the information war, as we see with the Ukrainian situation right now. Start thinking what it is you want to say and how it is you're going to deliver it. The sub bullet there of manner, tone, immediacy and reach um, are, are all important and, and you can work out and, and I'm delighted to expand on that in questions if you'd like. There is no single right way, but there are definite wrong ways in all of this. Don't be too silent. Don't, don't be too standoffish in all of this. Don't be too casual. Uh, this is a very serious matter. People have killed. You will be facing the next of kin at some later date, eye to eye, and you want to be really sure that the way you compose your message is, is going to be fit uh, for them. Don't put someone who's too junior uh, in front of the camera in any way whatsoever. The very first question, if it's not the CEO, is where is the CEO? Um, don't know too little. So if, if, if you've got to the stage in the few tens of minutes and after you know nothing, you look silly if you can't say anything. You're not a news reporter trying to fill in 24 hours worth of footage. You want to come when you've got something to say and be really careful about your early messaging. Again, as Amanda said earlier, because this has got to stand the test of time and you will walk yourself into trouble at a later stage. The very first question I was asked by the police uh, under pace uh, several months later is would I like to comment on my media interview that I gave uh, on the Monday afterwards? Uh, and, and therefore that is in, in a sense has got to be accountable. Um, this might, seem obvious, but as the CEO, go outwards and upwards. That's where your eyes, if, if you are in the luxury of having a deputy, that person needs to come inwards. And your deputy is going through a storm of herself as well, because uh, you've got traumatized staff all over the place who, who aren't necessarily acting normally, uh, necessarily acting logically, and they need handling. And again, that, uh, and the way you deal with them, they will hold you to account uh, for many months and years afterwards as well. So pinpoint your deputy into handling them. 
if you've got a head of comms or any person who amounts to that, who's got any sort of previous experience, or if it's just your IT person who is really, really good at, at handling the technical side of things, make them your next best friend. Take them right in and, and close, and you'll be sharing everything with, them, uh, everything with them over the next few days. And then I've also got a really good PA who's going to uh, deal with the, the media storm coming your way. Um, single point contact so that's my head of comms person just tell me where i need to be and and, and what and who i'm talking to and, and i'll be there because all i'm thinking about is what i'm going to say my only red line in all of these was i'm not doing politics step out of the arena that's going to be difficult this particular uh, occasion was uh, 10 days before a general election i can't tell you how happy the journalists were not to talk about politics and at that stage, I would contend it's too late for consultants, unless you've got one who is your best friend, who you know intimately and can be there, it's, it's too late. You're, 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 you're in it one way or the other. The only points I bring up here is um, when the Sky reporter on the left at 11 o'clock on a Sunday night says to me, what's your job title? So it can be uh, on, on, at the bottom of the screen. I said the clerk of the company, that was immediately confusing for her. That's why I dropped to be the CEO, because it's immediately uh, relatable. On, on both of these, think of the image, think of the backdrop. Fishmongers Hall is uh, on the right-hand side, so from late evening to early morning, I've now got the image I wanted in the background, because it, it's already telling a thousand words without me having to uh, translate it. The other point in here is, the challenge of talking to the lens only, which I'm looking into on my laptop really close and judging how close I want my head to be. It's really difficult when you've got a lot of background um, and noise, you've got people walking left and right behind the camera, you've got distractions to left and right. That's quite a skill. And in your ear is an earpiece in which you can hear the studio probably going through the weather forecast or the sports news just before it's your cue in. That, that, in a sense, is part of the skill set that is worth practicing if you get a chance. The audience on the right hand side is two and a half million. That is why you need to practice what it is uh, you're doing. What does it feel like? Um, well, it's no big deal, of course, until you're in it. And, and, and mostly it is because of overload. Um, firstly, the head of everywhere is about to be in touch. And the head of everywhere here was the church. You wouldn't think they could be so divided, but you've got um, two archbishops close, uh, sorry, one archbishop and two bishops close by, and even one either side of the River Thames in Southwark and in, 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 in the city. Um, you've got the state as in, uh, with a terrorist incident, this will probably go right up to the head of state. You've got the government, and that means opposition as well. You've got the mayoralty, which again in London is split between the city and wider. Uh, you've got the city corporation. Uh, you've got the police, which I put times two. You might even add times five. By the time you've got Metropolitan Police in charge, the City of London Police on their geography, British Transport Police involved, and in due course, the West Midlands uh, and Staffordshire Police as well. And they're not always completely joined up. Um, the media will find you. Oh my goodness, they will. If you thought you had a low profile on social media, they will come and find you in any way you want. And then of course, not just your real best friends, but your thousand other best friends are going to be in touch. And, and that, that's what I'm describing. 700 emails that weekend, 75 LinkedIn requests, of which probably three quarters were from media I've never heard of before. And, and once this incident was over, we'd probably never hear of uh, again. They're going to get you and it becomes confusing. It becomes quite comforting to simply answer the last email. Get out of that space. Do your thinking. This is what Twitter looked like. This is only an extract. This is not everything that sits there. The reason I bring this up is merely I said to head of comms, just give me a feel for who's tweeting what out there. And all I've highlighted in red is that Walker of the BBC, Sadiq Khan uh, of uh, the Mayor of London, Andrew Neil of, of, uh, of, of the Times, George Osborne of the 
evening standard and Marlon Sykes communications down the bottom. What I'm doing is giving a feel for it's coming all at you. And what you want is a sense of the tone. Is it with you or is it against you? And, and if, if 10 of them in this case were with us, there's going to be one that is going to be against you. And, and that will, don't, don't get too emotional on these things. Just go with the drift and get a feel for it, but don't drop into reading uh, every one of them. These, uh, again, look at the timings here. 11.42 on the left, 4.31 in the middle, 6.25. These are just examples of a typical mainstream a bit of Philip Kemp, well, Phil Kemp was the, um, the, the BBC producer for, 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 the, for the main news bulletins. Bang, he's found me from nowhere. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there's an example of how they come at you. In the middle, this is going international, Polish television in this case, uh, for, for, because um, one of the, the, the key fightback team was Polish. And, and on the right-hand side, um, just the sense of, can we help? When we mean can we help is, is, is can we help the individuals? Um, can we give them legal advice? Uh, can we give you insurance that you wish you'd had? Can we give you, you know, PR advice? Can you, th th these are people coming at you from every angle uh, with, with commercial intent in, in mind. O on here, 6.15 in the morning um, is just the mechanics of organizing interviews and all of that, again, straight over to my head of comms just tell me where i need to be because i haven't got time to to be doing these when you've got 19 you've got 31 interviews to do in one morning of which 19 uh, we accepted this is an indication of the uh, coming your way um sort of uh you know i can see the city of london police uh commissioner there i can see a metropolitan police commissioner there coming across the lord mayor faith leaders on on the left hand side bishop of london Mayor of London, a Prime Minister, a Minister, uh, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the Home Secretary, and then probably showing just to your right of your screen, my head of comms, just marshalling something that was way beyond his job description and bringing it in, in, into view. And, and at that point, you're part of that and, and the way you look and, 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 and so on. That, that's actually if what the, the, the public image is. It's of politicians getting involved. It must be at the top end. It's police and it's guns. And, and that's what, if you like, the popular image might be. Leads me to this question. Um, the, co the composition of America that, will, that must stand up to most scrutiny. I, I'm going to sort of jump to the very end in a way here. we going to show you a word cloud, which is this. This word cloud um, was a competition, a composition put together by my team of all of the media coverage that happened inside five days from the opening of the event. And that is what was coming across just by density of the words, giving you know, the, the size of, um, uh, of, of the individual text. And, and Fishmongers Hall across the top, Prisoner rehabilitation across the bottom, charity right up the middle, uh, other words from Lucas to Hero to Narwhal and, and so on. Uh, you would never wish this on any organization, but if it comes your way, those are the sort of words you would want in order to recover the situation or at least manage it to a neutral position until such time as you're out of the storm. And if you ever wanted to go through the exercise for your own organization, well, just try and compose one of these. What, what would you want in it as single words? What, what image is it that you're trying to um, put across? That's the way I do it. It's not the only way, it's just the way I thought about it. Uh, it's, this is a slide taken from a number of years ago when uh, I was in a different career uh, of, of just briefing people that if they are talking to television in, in, in charge of their own units in the military, uh, a natural beginning and an end, once upon a time, they all lived happily ever after, that, that sort of thing. Simple analogies, um, particularly if you've got difficult problems, like just run me by the security situation in Ukraine, or, or as it was there, the, the intelligence backdrop to the Middle East. You know, these are vastly complicated um, 
uh, scenarios uh, and therefore just give a little illustration in there. If you can get a hero in there, if there is one, fantastic. If there's a villain in there, well, choose carefully, but in our case, we, we, we had an obvious one, so it greatly helped. A, a, a punchline, what is it that you're outing with at the end of the message and anything else that you want to get in there? Um, I just show that one as well. I'm probably guilty of it right now. Leave out things you don't need to say. If you think you're getting into difficult territory, this is back to the politics uh, of, of terrorism or something like that, don't say it. Better to say less than too much and then run yourselves into trouble, particularly when Q&A comes. Um, confidence, retain strong eye contact, and that's again the one where the notes need to drop off and, and, and keep the strong eye contact it, it, it's that much more convincing, knowing that if you can keep it going for about 20 seconds, that's the piece they're going to take and all else will be dropped around it. Um, distinguish between fact and opinion. It is factually the case that this happened or that happened. In my opinion, I think this should be the case. You know, make, make that difference, then the police will always keep you in, in, in their good books. Impartial, unemotional. Uh, unemotional, I'd put a little star there. Um, it, it's a very difficult one there, but I think if you're the CEO type of position, you're the head of uh, an emergency services, then you're not going to be in the same position as perhaps the next of kin or, or, or another survivor, if you like, uh, who, who, who quite rightly may be showing heavy emotion. Now that takes quite a lot of competition. Uh, it depends on your character to be able to hold it together under intense pressure uh, over a long period of time. Never mislead. If you don't know, you don't know, and much better to give that uh, as an answer. Uh, I only show these ones because having been uh, open neck and, um, you know, in a jacket on the first occasion, because that's the image I wanted to put across, not out of touch, stuffy, too formal, this is after the inquest uh, immediately outside the courtroom where, where I do want to put precisely a different image across. So I've, I've, I've changed the gear, if you like, as BBC and, and, and ITV sort of you know, take their sort of pitch. And you need to think about those carefully. Yeah? I'm sure that's sort of granny stuff. And my very final one uh, slide here is uh, dawn to dusk. The first one is around about six in the morning and the, the one on the right hand side is around about six in the evening. It's a long old day when the media storm is on top of you and you need to pace yourself and Costa coffee and sausages for breakfast will keep you going for so long. But it's a long old day and, and I, 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 what I did in the middle of the afternoon, I simply went to bed for two hours, two whole hours to be really sure that I felt fresh for the next wave which was sure to come. And I'll tell you what, 48 hours later, it's probably all over. And whilst there is a long, long tail to this, which may last uh, a number of months, a number of years, and we're still in that tail, um, the, the immediate storm you've weathered, and then you can resort and just take things in slower time. Chris, that's my lot. Um, over to you. That was amazing. Um, a real masterclass. I've made so many, so many notes here. Um, Catherine, I think we do have some, some questions, and then I want to show one of the interviews that Toby uh, did which he said he actually hasn't seen himself, which I, I, that is amazing. Catherine, any questions? Oh, you're still on mute. A couple of questions before the video, um, and then perhaps um, some more afterwards, if that's all right. Um, so the first question is um, from Helen Breeze again. Do you think that any written statements, Toby, should come from a named person rather than a spokesperson? Um, written statements, um, for me, in the immediate aftermath, are too formal. Um, I think this is a point for voice and point for video. A written statement uh, can be, in a sense, thrown back at you and, and pulled apart, whereas by into being speaking to camera in, in, in sort of not, not informally it's a very formal sort of moment 
but you can always say, well, I, I was just saying it uh, as I heard it. Whereas anything which is a written statement gets very close to being a police statement, which gets very close to what you said. And so I would, if at all possible, make this a more human experience, um, want to, to stare people in the eye and, and say it like it is, uh, and, and perhaps not be a written statement. That's the sort of CEO of the multinationals that have probably run themselves into trouble by giving a sort of written statement and distancing themselves, not quite wanting to be the, the, the eye of it. it. It feels unaccountable and lacking transparency. Yeah, I think I'd agree with you. Amanda, have you got a comment on that? I'm sure you have a thought on that as well. Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I mean, I yeah. think uh, that's a really good point, so, but I would also say that if you do have to, then make it a named person and make sure that that's the person who's then appears very quickly on camera um, so that they can kind of back it up and then be very careful about what you do say in that first statement. Yeah. Um, next question, Toby, if you don't mind. Um, it seems as though you were very well prepared for this. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about whether you had a crisis communications plan to fall back on? Had you thought about this in advance, the possibilities of having an attack of some sort? And had you and your head of comms had discussions in advance of the attack? Uh, yes, no, yes, no. I, I would contend, as again, I said in the inquest, how many people had in their risk register the crisis communications plans for a pandemic? Mm. Uh, let's say three months before it happened, one month before it happened, on March the 22nd of 2019, uh, so uh, yes, 2019, probably no one. Um, so did we ever think terrorism would happen to us? No. Did, did we have a bespoke written one? I think as Amanda touched on earlier, you, you can have generic plans and it's very good to, um, to think through what those scenarios might, might be. So I have uh, just here crisis communication plans for Fishmonger's company, which addresses, um, simple issues like what happens if someone dies in an allergic reaction whilst uh, having a meal inside our hall? What happens if there's a protest, uh, which may be non-violent, inside the hall uh, because people want to record it and put it on the 10 o'clock news that night? So we had thought through those, but not in the depth that obviously hindsight has allowed us to since. A lot of our reaction was in a sense me just using my previous experience of this is the time to act and this is how we need to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chris, shall we have a video and then I'll ask some more questions? Yes, I see there's some, some popping up as we're speaking. I have got more questions, yes. yes. No, no, no. Let's, uh, let's just have a, have a look at this, uh, this interview here, just one of the, the very many uh, that uh, Toby did, because I think there are lots of takeouts for us as, as students and, and practitioners. So let's just watch this. I'm just this. going to tell you one viewpoint. Uh, the police statements will uh, piece all this together. I may miss uh, one or two elements, but this is a guy called Lucas. He's the guy who cleans the glasses down in the basement, and that's exactly what he was doing when he hears this scream. Uh, the scream is so loud that uh, as a first aider, he uh, makes a uh, choice. He goes towards the uh, trouble. He gets there on the first floor of the building just behind me. And uh, it's pretty clear that uh, there's a bad guy. He's got two knives in his hand. Uh, there's blood, there's screaming, there's chaos. Lucas uh, pulls off the wall this, uh, this long stick. He charges towards uh, the bad guy and uh, he, he, he impacts him on the chest. And uh, there's um, clearly something here that is protective and uh, it doesn't make any, uh, any, any, any sort of impact. Uh, but he's buying time. He allows others to, uh, to escape, to move to uh, adjacent rooms. Uh, at that point, he's got about a, uh, a one-minute, one-on-one uh, -one straight combat. Uh, this guy we now know by the name of Khan. He works his way up uh, Lucas's uh, pole, slashing with this knife, and takes uh, he takes five wounds to his uh, left side, and uh, he's uh, going to lose some strength on that side. But he's done what he needed to do in the first instance. So uh, two other guys who are um, uh, part of the charity. One's got a fire extinguisher now, and uh, one's got this narwhal tusk uh, ripped off the wall. Uh, they come and join the fight, and uh, it's pretty gruesome. Uh, I think the, uh, the terrorist decided he was outnumbered. He runs for it. He, uh, he goes down the main staircase. And the next, uh, the next bit of hell is, uh, is at reception. He can't get out the front door. So he turns to reception when our, our, our guy called Gareth, who's the, uh, the doorman, 
is, is pushing the door shut as, 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 as good as he can so that Dawn, a yard behind, can get on the telephones, uh, hit the alarms, do exactly as her training is told to do. Khan shifts his position to the cloakroom. The girls there, uh, Alla and Sandra, they, they, they have a hell of a time. Uh, and then eventually it all comes to a great sort of showdown in the, uh, in, in, in the entrance hall. Uh, Lucas is back in this point, leading the, uh, le leading the charge. Uh, and Andy's the, uh, the last guy I introduced here. He's our maintenance man. I'll tell you what, two things. He's the Ministry of Defence uh, ex-policeman, uh, and he's also a pretty cool customer. But when the knife goes to his chest and, uh, you know, kill or open the door is the, uh, is the choice. Uh, he pauses for a moment. He's, uh, he's reluctant to spill all this out onto the pavement when uh, members of the public are going to be uh, facing the same problems. But he makes exactly the right choice. The door's opened. Uh, out uh, the terrorist falls and uh, uh, and the first one after him is uh, Lucas shouting uh, at everyone to get out of the way, get back. Uh, but I tell you what, members of the public, they just don't do that nowadays. Uh, they, uh, they, they do what they needed to do. They join in, uh, the man with the fire extinguisher, the man with an arm or tusk, they're all in there. Lucas is uh, losing, uh, losing strength on his left side at this point, but um, I tell you what, his job is done. Amazing. 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 So I think there really, uh, yeah. stop that chair. They won't let me stop that chair. And I don't know why, but never mind. Here we go. I think we're okay. I think there's, there's just so many takeouts from that, what you were just saying, Toby, about narrative, heroes and villains, real people. But in terms of classic crisis comms, we all talk about the, the three C's of concern, compassion, and control. Um, and I think we can tick all of those. It's a really great example. Catherine, back to you. I think we have some more Q's and A's. Yeah, I've, I've got some lovely comments about what a great narrative that is and how, um, how, how compelling, frankly. Um, one comment, very interesting. Um, Toby, do you think your interview would have been any different if Usman Khan had survived? Um, one can never be absolutely sure with the counterfactual as to exactly how one would have handled it. Um, I think probably the same. The facts I was dealing with, whilst they needed a lot of fine tuning uh, in, in, in the police statements that were to follow, I, I'd been able to talk on the telephone. This incident happened on a Friday afternoon. So uh, by Saturday midnight plus, you know, sorry, Monday, sorry, Friday midnight plus, people were going home. So everything was being done by the phone. It wasn't sort of some great coming together. But I managed to talk to enough of our key witnesses as, a, as opposed to the, uh, you know, the, the attendees who, who I didn't personally know and, and um, weave together enough of the story. So I knew I was on facts. I wasn't apportioning any blame. Um, I wasn't uh, giving the backdrop as to whether should people should be out of prison and you know, into the politics of all of that. Um, there was only, in a sense, a, a, a compassion and a, um, um, a, a com commendation, if you like, to, to, to be offered as, as the key messages. And do you know what? I don't really care whether it was in Carnaby and Live at that point. That was the story, and I knew it to be true. So um, if, that, if he wanted to argue the difference at a later stage, he, he, he could have done that. Of course, yeah. it never turned out that way. No. Can I... Can I just say that I would Absolutely. be really concerned about that um, because having been on the other side of it, um, I think whilst you totally understand why Toby would you know, approach it in the way he did, um, it does make a huge difference. Um, and, you know, even though um, obviously the, the suicide bomber was, was, was dead, um, because we knew that there was going to be an investigation that would go for his accomplices, that would go for, you know, what ended up to be his brother that, that was uh, finally um, convicted. Um, you, you, you've always got to have that in your mind. And, and, and I've nearly ended up um, having to give evidence in a court case because of what we put out as the police and how they were challenging who knew what at what point and at what time, what, when had we said something. So... I, I would just add that from my old kind of background. Mm, mm, mm. I think much of Toby's story narrative there was about the, the people at the, at the hall who uh, were uh, um, seeking to defend uh, others. But you're right, Amanda. Yeah, we need to we need to think that that angle through to interesting stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Any more? Any more questions? Yep, I've got another couple of questions. Um, to, 
Toby and Amanda, what advice do you have for a, co a comms team who operates in a regulatory environment who are facing prolonged crises or a prolonged crisis, one or more, with back-to-back -back issues? I can think of several companies I've worked with like that. <laughs> What's your advice? Um, I'd almost turn it back. You're, you're the professionals. Why, why would I, you know, have a particular view on that? I think if, um, if, if pushed, in my personal view, transparency and accountability will stand the test of time. Be, if, if you are consistent in what you are saying, because that is what the truth is, then whilst it may go through uncomfortable periods, particular if there's been shortfall or uh, things you, you would want to have done different with hindsight, as long as you are transparent and accountable all the way down the line, the story's got nowhere else to go. It is already at the sort of bottom level and in a sense can only get better. And that's probably true as to whether you're um, working on a good news story or a bad news story. Don't allow it to get worse. I, I think that would be my, 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 my point. Um, I, I can give you lots of military examples of trying to, let's say, you know, justify why we went to war in Afghanistan or why we went to war in Iraq. Um, th those are existential problems because they're, they're going to be there for years <laughs> and, and you're not the spokesman for the government of the day to, to give an opinion as to why that is, so therefore stick in lane much closer in. Now that's tricky if you're in a big company that's got a long-seated problem that you need to sort of deal with. Um, but that's not my issue this time round. Interesting. Amanda, what do you think? What's your view on that? Um, yeah, I suppose that having been in an organisation that very similarly had, you know, ongoing problems and crises don't happen neatly one after the other, you can be in the middle of one when another happens. Um, I think the key is to have some structure around it so that you, um, you, you are building dealing with crisis into your day-to-day -day activity you know and not trying to make it this additional kind of add-on problem um, and there's lots of simple ways you can kind of do that I think focus on the resilience of the team as well because if they're going to be constantly under pressure like that very quickly you can get overwhelmed so it's what kind of resources are in place how do you manage the resources you've got and how can people get downtime um, and then obviously not knowing the situation you're dealing with, but it's just trying to unpick it. Is this an ongoing kind of problem with lots of different elements to it? Is it different overlaying things? Because I think some, sometimes it's worth mapping that out, as, as Toby was saying, you know, is it that you've got an incident and then your response to it's poor? So then you've got another incident on top of that, um, because all that will affect your comms and also um, affect your decision making. So it's trying to work that through. I think the fact you're in a regulatory kind of environment, um, you'll be used to it. So you'll know the boundaries that you've got to work within. Um, so I wouldn't let that then affect necessarily kind of what, what you do. Um, other than just you're cognizant of it as, as part of the wider kind of environment. It just, just made me think in actual fact about uh, something we've blogged on recently, Catherine, the Velcro effect. When uh, an organisation becomes the centre of a storm, lots of different issues become linked. And it's about this issue of narrative, as, as, as Toby was talking about, being able to step back, think. I was very impressed when Toby explained carving out some time for you to actually look at the bigger picture and think, what is the narrative? You know, it may be a collection of happenings, but when it all comes together, it, it tells a different story. And, and I think, that... um, Chris, Sorry. one of the issues there is that people want to hear from someone who sounds authoritative mm. and has got good judgment. Now, that wasn't particularly hard for me. I was just piecing together lots of little anecdotes and working out what that storyline was. So I'm not, you know, uh, um, I, I, I'm not putting that onto a much bigger sort of scenario. It was fairly straightforward, but but for the mood of the moment, 48 hours after it happened, that that is what the public needed, and no one else was going to fill the gap, and and certainly the police weren't. So therefore, just help them in their direction going forwards. Mm, interesting, Catherine. We're really up against time here. Do we have many more questions? I've got two more questions. Okay, cool. if that's all right. So just the last two. Um, the first question is, um, sorry, um, Toby, in the eye of the storm, how did you prioritise which media outlets will get face-to-face -face time with you? Did you choose mm. to exclude any deliberately? 
Also, did you have time to manage people or groups trying to coerce or hijack your comms for their own gain? I suppose the you has to include your comms director as well. Team. So, um, f first of all, um, go with the mainstream, uh, the BBC, ITV and Sky. If you've got those running with you, then the rest will will often sort of fall off that. You may want to, pr uh, to also prioritise one big regional for us, you know, BBC London News, if you like, uh, but Manchester would have an equivalent. But as long as you've got those, then the rest is a question of how interested they are and how, how much capacity you've got as to how many you're going to do. There was a Polish angle, so uh, I, I, I um, you know, we accommodated that, no problem. You'll quickly go from the visual media to the print media wanting, you know, their own sort of piece. So your specific question was, did we exclude anyone? We did exclude one when after about four hours of doing this, um, we retired for a cup of coffee and a tabloid journalist came for his special couple of minutes and he said, if I give you some money, will you tell me something extra? Ooh. <laughs> now, now that, that was the bit in which my head of comms gave a sharp kick under the table and said, boss, we're now off. And he was absolutely right. But that is the angle they will try for, because I, I had nothing extra to give. If, if it was worth yeah. saying to one, I was going to say it to all, and, and I sort of felt I'd done my bit. Did yeah. I turn one down? I did. When a Canadian journalist from Yellowknife uh, was on the end of the radio asking for an insight on narwhal tusks. <laughs> and, you know, I said, I. I I, I have no idea as to how old the narwhal tusk and you know all the details he wanted. I, I said I had no idea. You know, I am not a specialist in in the David Attenborough sense, so I, <laughs> I declined that interview, which he wanted live on his his his, his radio. Interesting. Well, it's always good advice. If you don't know the answer, don't guess. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Final question then. It's about recovery. Seems good to have this at the end. So Amanda, in your presentation, you mentioned that the recovery is sometimes much more difficult and more drawn out. So I wondered um, what the experience of, of both of you is of recovery and whether you have any tips for our participants about recovery, how to handle the recovery, how to best plan for the recovery. We've only got five minutes left, I should add. Who wants to go first? Thank you, Amanda. Amanda. Oh, well, uh, there's a whole chapter in the book. No, I would say that. Um, <laughs> the the, <laughs> the key, key thing is uh, don't just fall from crisis to recovery. Plan it. Um, look at what you've learned. Look at what ha was happening before. And really, if you're not, if you go through something as serious as, as some of the things we've been talking about today, if you don't use it to develop, change, um, move forward, then you're missing an, an opportunity along the way. But the key thing is it does get more complicated. It does get challenging. You, you know, from, from a comms perspective, you've got the crisis, you've got planning for recovery, you've got normal work coming back. Um, be realistic around the resources you've got and prioritise what you're doing, but keep a focus on going forwards. And for, for me, the, the big learning kind of I had, which is why I got really frustrated over the last two years with COVID, is don't talk about going back to normal because there's no such thing. Because with something, if something's that big and affects you that much, then it's about moving forward, not going backwards. Mm. Interesting. Toby, what are your thoughts? I think I can echo Amanda without needing to uh, repeat on that. I'd probably go back to how do you prepare for the next time round. Um, I, I'm not one of the 10% of the population who's got the gift of the gab. I, I, I'm not one of the 10% of the population who you should never put in front of a camera ever. I'm one of the 80% in the middle that has to work at this, that has to practice, that has to think, that has to work out lines to take. And um, the way to do that, I think, is to, is, is to practice. And Catherine, we talked uh, on a previous time about simply stick yourself in front of your own iPhone and record 25 seconds worth of what it is you actually do, uh, and then get someone to give you a couple of difficult corollaries to that. Do that once a month, and you're probably on top of what your organization is all about. If you don't practice it at all, Watch out when the pressure comes on, because this is not a skill that is automatic to everyone. It needs to be worked on uh, routinely. And 
um, you have an insurance for your fire building down, uh, but fire uh, your, your building burning down. Why wouldn't you have one for your comms strategy? Mm, that's good advice. I think we can Very easily do point. and should do. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Toby. And thank you, Amanda. And thanks, thank you, Catherine, as well. Really a great session. So many learnings. Um, I'm going to have to write the blog, Catherine. I know we were saying. Right, right. <laughs> <It's been laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you found it useful. Um, and interesting. Um, it's not often you get the chance to talk to people like Amanda and Toby who've been through such experiences and, and shared them in such a frank, open, useful way. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm just going to stop the recording here and uh, we will be sending that recording out to uh, all of